Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we'll try and get started here uh, to stay on schedule. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming on behalf of uh, the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at CSIS. Welcome. And uh, uh, we hope uh, this will be uh, uh, a useful and interesting uh, presentation as well as discussion afterwards. My name is Guy Benari. I'm the Deputy Director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at CSIS. Uh, to my right is Greg Sanders, uh, one of the lead authors of this report. You will notice that our program director, uh, Mr. David Berto, uh, could not be with us this morning. Uh, he sends his regrets. Um, he's had a family emergency come up and uh, unfortunately will not be able to uh, make it in this morning. Um, so um, um, with that, um, we'll get going. I think just one um, um, household rule, uh, um, if you'd please uh, silence your cell phones for uh, the duration of this presentation. Um, the other uh, thing I forgot to mention is to welcome our uh, viewers online. Um, um, you are welcome to follow along um, using the presentation that was posted online uh, in case you can't uh, see the one that we'll be going through on the screen here. Uh, we'll try to uh, hopefully um, maintain sort of a, a pace that allows uh, the online viewers to, to follow along as well. Um, I hope everybody has a copy of the actual report. Uh, we will be referencing uh, the page numbers uh, as we go through the presentation to uh, help those uh, viewers online as well as those here in, in the audience to follow along. So let's begin by, by understanding when we say uh, professional, uh, when we say services industrial base, uh, uh, what do we really mean? Um, maybe a little bit of history uh, on our work here at, uh, at uh, DIG to those of you who are uh, uh, newcomers to our, our work. Um, we've been doing this uh, project uh, of looking at uh, service contracting for about five years now. Yeah. Um, we've had three previous editions of this report. Um, we've also been looking uh, at uh, specific government agencies in terms of their, uh, their contracting and trends, multi-year trends in, in contracting. We've looked at the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. There are copies of those reports uh, outside as well uh, for those of you uh, who'd care to look at those. But um, on service contracting specifically, what we've done in the past is uh, look more closely at uh, what we call professional services. So the first three uh, versions of this report uh, uh, from previous years um, looked at a slightly narrower subset of service contracts. They did not include primarily uh, contract service contracts in the uh, construction and medical categories. These have now for this year's report been included and really, when we say service contracting today, we mean all different types of services um, that are out there that the government contracts for. In order to make the, this uh, uh, data, we're still talking about uh, about one and a half uh, million contract actions a year in service contracting, um, federal government wide. We broke down the uh, uh, service contract actions into these key categories that you see up there on the screen and in your reports. Um, in previous years, when we were doing professional services, we had five categories. The new category this year is the medical services category. And we folded construction services in with uh, uh, one of the five categories we had in previous years, which is the facilities related services category. So that category now includes construction as well. A few notes on where we get our data and uh, uh, some things to note about that data. Um, we use the Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS, uh, almost exclusively, although we do uh, use uh, other sources to uh, cross-reference and cross-check uh, the data in FPDS. Um, this database includes all federal uh, contracts um, and contract actions um, for product services and R&D. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, by the way, we consider R&D 
a service, uh, and we include that in, in our service uh, report this year and in previous years. Um, the FPDS has some uh, uh, um, limitations uh, that are worth noting uh, before you uh, uh, um, get uh, angry at what the data can or cannot show. Um, the first limitation is that uh, there's no classified data uh, reported in FPDS. It only includes prime contracts. There's no uh, subcontracts in there either. Um, and one other, I won't go through this whole list, it's there for, for you to see and we go into details in the report, but one other important caveat is that there are sometimes classification issues in terms of how certain service categories are classified in FPDS versus in company records. Uh, the example we uh, like best here, I think, um, is of the log cap contract, which for years in FPDS uh, was classified as an R&D contract. Nobody knows why, at least nobody that we've talked to. There must have been a reason for it. Um, it's now been changed, um, but of course, in the, the records of the companies that, that were performing this contract, this showed up as a logistic support or a professional services uh, support contract. Um, that's now how it's uh, classified. Um, but again, for several years, it was an R&D contract, and so there, and we've seen that with other contracts as well, where there's a mismatch between the way it's classified uh, in FPDS and the way it's classified in the company's records or reports to shareholders. Anything else on this? Uh, Subcontract data is now becoming available, but it's primarily for 2011. We may incorporate that into future iterations of a report, but um, unfortunately, when it became available, it did not become available retroactively. Right, so we'll give it a year or two to populate and start looking at that then as well. And similarly, um, when we have noticed egregious errors like that, if they change the overall top line, for example, Emerson Construction in 2008 was given a 13 billion contract was taken away shortly into fiscal year 2009. We made that adjustment. But as a general rule, we always follow FPDS's classification and we'll inform them if we note a notable error rather than trying to change things on our end. Right. Okay, the first slide on the, the, uh, this deck is actually one of the uh, last slides in your report, but this will be the, first, uh, the last time uh, uh, that we make you flick back and forth. Uh, we'll, we'll stick to the order of the report uh, once we get past this one. Uh, but we really thought that um, it's important to look at the, the service contracting world in, in the broader context of all government discretionary spending, and that's what you see here. The bottom blue bar on, the, on this chart is service contracts from 2000 to 2010. The red uh, slice above the blue one is other uh, contract spending. Um, this is primarily products, but also include, includes anything that's unlabeled in FPDS. Um, and then the green bar, or the green slice of each bar, is, the, is all other discretionary spending. Um, that the federal government uh, um, um, funds. And so you see uh, in the dotted line at the top of the screen, the share of service contracts as, uh, as uh, out of the total uh, discretionary spending by the federal government. And it's been uh, a steady, it's seen a steady increase over the last decade, as you can see, primarily uh, between 2003, 2008. Um, after which it sort of plateaued and then dipped for the first time um, in 2009-2010 uh, timeframe. But at its peak, it was at about 28% of uh, discretionary spending. It's now at around 25%. Anything else on this? This next chart on page six of your reports, if you'll uh, kindly flip uh, uh, to the beginning, um, shows you the, just the total numbers for service contract action spending. Um, and by the way, when we say spending, what, the column we look at in FPDS is actual obligations. Um, so this is money actually spent. Um, and you can see sort of the, 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 the rise in, in 
uh, service contract spending over the last decade uh, on the, the, the bars, whereas uh, the line, the blue line, shows you the number of contract actions. And you can see on the right-hand side there on the legend that while the dollar amounts have grown at a seven and a half uh, uh, compound annual growth rate over this 11 year period, uh, the number of contract actions has grown at twice that rate. So from a government perspective, um, if, if you consider the number of contract actions uh, uh, um, as sort of your, your workload for your uh, federal contracting officers, that workload has grown significantly. Um, if you're looking at it from the industry perspective, your average contract action has really decreased um, because the number of contract actions grew faster than the total dollars here. And so you're, if you're operating in this uh, sphere, the federal services contracting uh, world, you're really in the recent years, having to run fast just to stay in place. You're, in order to make the same number of, of uh, revenue from service contracts, uh, you have to land a larger amount of those dollars, of those contract actions. And as a small data note, um, for 2005 and 2008, the number of contract actions had actually skyrocketed thanks to a change in classification by the VA their equipment-related rental and maintenance codes saw a huge increase, we think roughly explained by actually counting every instance of service and maintenance as a separate contract action. They've since changed their classification scheme. In 2009 and 2010, they're more in line with the rest of the government. So for 05 to 08, we removed those specific codes so that the data would follow the current classification and be consistent. All right, slide number six is uh, on page seven of your reports, and this shows you the breakdown of the uh, service contracts into those six categories that we mentioned earlier. Um, we'll go over them very quickly now, but uh, and uh, in more detail at a later stage in this presentation. Uh, but starting from the bottom is research and development, service, service contract actions. Um, a quick methodological note here is that um, for the purpose of this study, we have removed from R&D services those services classified as research and development support services. Um, these are uh, uh, not a substantial, uh, not substantial in terms of the value, but in terms of methodological rigor, we felt that they are more appropriately classified under the professional and administrative support uh, service category and that's where we've classified those. Uh, and again, uh, bear in mind that since there's no classified data in FPDS, um, um, R&D in our minds is the category that has uh, been affected the most by that because a lot of research and development contracts, primarily DOD R&D contracts, are classified. Um, second slice from the bottom is equipment-related services. Um, the green slice is uh, the facilities-related services and now construction as well this year. Um, the purple slice in the middle is IT. Professional administrative and management support services, what we call PAMS, um, is the blue bar on the top. Between PAMS and uh, um, FRS and construction, those are the two largest categories, obviously, in the, the federal services market, and the ones that have uh, that have also grown quite substantially in terms of uh, in terms of uh, percentage. Um, you can see those in the in the parentheses next to the on the legend there. PAMS growing at about 11 percent per year. Um, FRS. Uh, actually, not so much, 5.3%. The fastest growing category is actually the smallest category in terms of uh, share, uh, uh, in terms of dollars. That's the medical services category in the orange bar at the top, um, growing at almost 15%, but uh, nevertheless accounting for just about $16 billion in uh, the last fiscal year. And then other is all other services that aren't included in any one of those six categories. Um, 
significant share, but there's not one uh, service code here in FPDS that uh, amounts to any significant uh, uh, amount in terms of the dollars, and so we did not break those down beyond those six categories that you see up here. And as a note on medical, since it's new to report this year, um, the primary driver there is DOD spending. It's not HHS. And so much of the growth can probably be attributed to the wars. In addition, remember that this is only contracts. So various other mechanisms that the federal government delivers, um, medical spending, grants, direct transfers, et cetera, are not showing up in that category. Right. And, and apropos DOD, we'll see this a little bit later in the presentation. DOD is the key driver for all service contracts in, in the federal uh, market, accounting for about 60% uh, of all the total dollars spent on service contracts every year. Um, so for every, almost every category, with a few exceptions, as, as we will see, uh, a majority of the, the growth can probably be attributed not just to DOD, uh, but also in terms of the time frame during which it occurred to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This next chart, um, page eight on your reports, shows uh, the different contract vehicles used uh, to contract out the federal uh, service contracts. Um, we've broken it down into two key categories and then uh, of uh, definitive contracts and indefinite uh, delivery vehicles. When, and then broken down the IDV category into a few other uh, subsets, as you can see on the chart. What's interesting uh, to note is the growth in multiple award IDCs and definite delivery contracts. Um, that's the orange slice second from the top on your charts, uh, which accounted for 13% of the service contract actions by dollar value in 2000, uh, 2006, I'm sorry, and in 2010 grew to 18% of uh, um, all service contracts. Anything else on this? By the way, feel free to ask any questions during the presentation or ask them uh, towards the end, whatever your preference is. Yes, Tom? It was excluded altogether. Yeah. Yep. Same for construction. And I should also note for our online viewers, as it shows on the page, you can email into gsanders at csas.org with questions, and I'll try to monitor them as best I can. Next chart um, looks at the funding mechanisms used for service contracts. Um, and again, we've tried to. Uh, sort of use the categories that FPDS provides us, but then also uh, collect them into broader categories for, for uh, ease of uh, both uh, analysis and also uh, understanding of broader trends. And so the, the main categories here that we have at the bottom in the blue are the fixed price contracts, and at the top in the sort of uh, grayish, reddish, um, the cost reimbursement dollars. You can see that the, the, there's been significant growth over this 11-year uh, period in the firm fixed price contracts. In fact, that's the, the, the highest growth uh, of all these categories, from 37% uh, by value of uh, service contracts in 2006 to 43% in 2010. And part of that we, we attribute to the push uh, since uh, 2009 by the Obama administration to do more fixed price contracting, um, just as a sort of an overall policy. Uh, but as we'll see in some of the other slides, in some agencies and in some service areas, this has been a, a, a trend that uh, that's goes even further back than 2009. No, so there's these two, two uh, distinct categories. Um, 
firm fixed price is the one that I was talking about that, that grew at the largest pace. Uh, but we've got other fixed price uh, lumped together as the second category in this, uh, in this broader fixed price category, and that's the light blue uh, slice, second from the bottom on each of these bars. And there had been a rise in the combination uh, category, which um, simply refers to contracts or contract actions that use multiple sorts of funding mechanisms, which of course increases the amount of ambiguity, makes it more difficult to study these issues. That has now dropped off from 2009 to 2010, which we consider somewhat commendable as it's part of an overall, mechanism, overall drive to improve data quality in FPDS. The downside of this is that they are classified by the majority funding mechanism. So it is possible that some of these contract actions are 60% fixed price and thus are now entirely in the fixed price category. We don't have any transparency into that particular issue. But keep this in mind when interpreting 2009, 2010 changes are driven in large part by a reclassification of combination rather than necessarily a growth in the individual category. But if, if there's a contract which is, uh, you know, the labor hour is by firm fixed price and the rest is by cost, so how do you categorize that? We follow FPDS. Uh, FPDS often breaks it up into individual parts, but they reserve a right to um, classify by majority of contract dollars. This is another one of those instances where we take the FPDS data as it is, uh, which we, for the most part, do. But uh, here, more so than in other areas, we we don't attempt to sort of uh, get into their their heads and figure out why certain contracts were combination versus others. Yes, it is. Yes. This is the more detailed version. Next chart uh, takes us into uh, competition and the extent of competition um, that uh, is used for service contracts. A quick uh, methodological note here as well. Um, while FPDS, um, FPDS's definition of competition uh, is uh, based on the, the uh, contract um, officer's definition. Um, we take a slightly different approach here. Um, we have, again, these two broad categories of uh, uh, competition and no competition. A uh, third category is actually competition with single offer. Um, that's the middle one in sort of the, the light purple. Um, the reason we break that out is that Looking at it from the industrial base perspective, the fact that a contract was competed but only received a single offer uh, tells us that there really was no competition available to the government in that, for that particular contract. And so we, despite the fact that for reporting purposes in FPDS and uh, in other uh, government databases, um, the fact that a contract was competed is good enough to categorize it as a competed or a competition. Uh, we felt uh, we needed to apply a more stringent um, 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 limit here. Um, and if, again, if there was only one offer, uh, despite the fact that a contract was competed, we did not consider there to have been a competition. And so that's the explanation be, uh, behind the, the way we've broken out the data here. Uh, and despite that, you can see that um, actually the, the full and open competition category where not only was the, the contract competed, but there were more than one offer uh, received by the government for that contract. Uh, that's the category that has grown the most, from 42% of the uh, dollar value in 2006 to 48% in 2010. Again, there was, in the last few years, a push uh, uh, by uh, uh, um, the executive branch to compete more. Um, and to uh, uh, increase the number of uh, uh, full and open competitions. Um, what the breakdown of uh, whether or not there were multiple offers allows you to do is see whether we've hit any sort of uh, uh, glass ceiling in terms of competition. There might be uh, service areas where you might want more competition, but you just can't get it. 
Yes, sir. Right. You want to take that one? Um, the way everything is classified for competition, so though it has a certain amount of holdover. So if something in, is initially competed uh, or if it's offered to a small number, uh, a lot of the ones involved pre-classification like the IDIQ are probably in the limited competition category. Those are various areas like small business set aside and the like, where the number of competitors is limited for some reason, but it is still competed. So I would suspect that that's where most of it shows up. But all IDIQ dollars are in FPDS, and they are all classified for competition. And just a quick follow-up. Yes. Yeah, right. But the FPDS rules, as I interpret them, generally speaking, do as you say, that uh, it's off the initial competition. There is, in fact, a category for follow-on to competed action, you can see, or you might not be able to see as it's tiny. I see, I see, yeah. Exactly. So that is not consistent with the amount that happens in reality. So that is a very narrow definition of what a follow-on to competed action is. In general, it's off of the initial competition. Did I answer your question? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Looks at the industrial base side of, uh, of the services uh, market, um, and it really shows you how many contractors are active in this market over the last decade. Um, the blue uh, part of the bar at the bottom of your, the dark blue at the bottom of your uh, charts is the number of contractors who perform at least one contract action that's worth more than $25,000 in a particular year. And that part, as you can see, has remained relatively steady. There's, there's growth there, but it's not, uh, it's not dramatic. On the light blue uh, uh, slices at the top of the bars, on the other hand, these are the contractors who do uh, contracts that are worth less than $25,000, that don't have any, any business with the federal government in the service area that's worth more than $25,000. And you can see the, the spike in that, um, in that uh, population. Uh, part of that is attributable to uh, uh, reporting requirements in FPDS. In 2004, with the move to FPDS Next Generation, NG, the requirements uh, dropped from uh, $25,000 to $2,500. So uh, any contract worth $2,500 or more is now in FPDS, whereas in previous years it wouldn't have to be unless it was $25,000 or more. So part of the growth is attributed to that, but we think that there's also part of that growth that's attributable to just the rise in um, sort of uh, uh, smaller chunks of work being undertaken by, by a larger, larger number of companies. Um, as the market grew and as, uh, uh, um, again, a lot of it driven by DOD and operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, it appears that uh, a lot of smaller companies uh, uh, managed to get smaller uh, contract actions just because there was so much more new work to be done. Sorry? Yes. Would the data, would you be able to suss out from the data contractors that uh, contract in much higher levels, a million dollars worth of that? Yes, yes. This, the 25,000 was sort of just our, our uh, yeah, cutoff. Um, so contractors that were that won contracts in excess of a million dollars. 
Is it in, in the report on backups? Um, it's not in the report, but we do have those numbers and can follow up with anyone interested. I think that would be some other gradation, if you will. Right. Right. Um, we, we picked that number because that was the reporting threshold for, for previous years, but. Right, right, right. And you can, you can effectively add another slice to each bar and, you know, with a, a higher threshold. Um, and, and slice the data based on it. The trend, of course, that many of us are interested in is, is the number of contractors at the high end, are they decreasing by virtue of increased consolidation in the services right. framework, or increasing for that matter? Right. No, that's a very good point. You're going to have to be careful there because you're going to get a lot of overlap. Companies at the high end that also do this blending all the way. Right. Um, well, get to that in a, a minute actually. Actually, why don't we move to the next chart and we, we can have that discussion. Um, this chart on page 17 of your reports uh, breaks down the services uh, uh, market by size of company. And again, for the sake of uh, uh, working with uh, a manageable number of categories, we've broken it down into small, medium, and large companies here. Um, and the classification is as follows. A small company is any company that in FPDS is classified as small. So that's an easy one. Um, it's usually based on the Small Business Administration's guidelines. So if you're a small, if you've, you're small company certified, that'll be entered into FPDS and uh, we count you as a small company. Um, the large companies, um, we consider a company to be large if it's doing three billion or more dollars worth of annual revenue, not just from federal service contracts or federal contracts, any revenue, all revenue sources. So if you're three billion dollars or more every year, you're a large company for our purposes. If you're neither a small nor a large, you're a medium. And we've gone into a little bit more uh, granularity in the report in terms of how we break down the medium-sized companies as well, um, because we realized that um, not small or large is a pretty uh, fuzzy definition of medium, um, but for these purposes, that's, that's what we're working with. So effectively, if you know, the SBA cutoff for a small company, and it varies by industry, but let's say it's around 20 or $25 million in annual revenue, um, the medium slice of the, the each bar here uh, covers companies that uh, make between 25 million and 2.99 billion dollars worth of annual revenue. So that's a pretty wide uh, range there. So, so you're using the total company revenues as opposed to revenues in this particular market? Right, right. Total revenues. Because. Um, what if a company just happens to do, to do nothing in the service? Right, or it. Has $5 billion revenue. We'll count it as a large. So large yes. In this yes. Yes. Um, the, no, that's, that's appreciated. I think the, the, our reasoning behind that was that for purposes of uh, sort of bidding and doing business with government, um, if you're a large company, you have uh, sort of the, the, the overhead and the, the, the experience and the, the, the um, infrastructure, if you will, to do that better than a small company, even if that small company does, you know, uh, a large extent of business with the federal government. And also for the purposes of just understanding the industrial base, um, we're interested in who's participating and not um, uh, uh, how, how much they're, they're in for, if you will. Uh, we, we go into that a little bit later, but uh, for the purpose of small, medium, and large, um, we, we felt it was, it was a better reflection of the way the industrial base is structured to go with, uh, with annual revenue as opposed to government revenue. Yeah, I would just suggest if you've got the data in your database, sure. to evaluate based upon the level of contracted services right. as opposed to total revenue, which has nothing to do with contracted 
Absolutely. Yes, that's right, Cecil. That involved a great deal of work. Um, <laughs> where it's by nature imperfect, but we've gone through a variety of sources. This year we've actually started working with Bloomberg government, among other sources, who have also done their own consolidations. We've cross-checked with them. And our cutoff, we've inspected every company that has a contract revenue of at least half a billion. And our $3 billion threshold is in part to make sure that we have a fairly good chance of identifying the uh, revenue of a private company. Um, it is difficult. There is not a single standard source. There, there are some figures in the Federal Registry that are included in FPDS. Unfortunately, when we've inspected those, they're often off by an order of magnitude, and by often, I mean at least half the time. So. In essence, we've tried to use any source we have available and to cross-check against multiple sources to discern that. Um, but yes, there's not, unfortunately, a simple answer. And I should also add, um, this is one area where we do think we have real added value because for our large classification, large trumps small. If you are a small company that has been bought out and we have noticed that either directly um, by looking for various merger and acquisition reports through Bloomberg or any number of other sources, then you are, after a merger and acquisition has occurred, um, if, ha if half of your business was after it for that fiscal year, classified as large. So as a result, the percentage of small in our categorization is a bit lower than the official federal government percentage, which is consistent with the law in their case but we thought it was more informative to follow large rather than small in that instance. So to now look at what the data actually show us, um, there's, there's uh, two interesting trends here. Um, one is that it appears at least uh, that the government small business set-asides are, are working. Uh, we know that uh, in 96 or 97, I believe, the, uh, the government goal was set of uh, having some 23% of government contracts being uh, contracted to small businesses. Um, in uh, the federal services area, we're at about 20, 22%. Um, and that's, um, that's been relatively steady throughout the 10-year period. The other interesting uh, point is the, the uh, sort of rise and fall, if you will, of uh, the large companies. Um, you see that in the, the green line at the top of the chart, um, where um, for a significant amount of years during this past decade, uh, the share of the market held by large companies uh, was growing. Um, but that sort of peaked in uh, 2007, started dipping in 2008, and in 2010 dipped uh, quite significantly yet again. Um, so, uh, and, and since small companies stayed relatively constant in terms of their share of the market during this period, um, the, the gr rise and fall of the large companies has uh, come uh, in parallel to the rise and fall of the medium-sized companies. Um, so whereas in previous years, when we looked at professional services, and again, we excluded uh, uh, the key category that was excluded from that was construction, um, we saw for professional services uh, what we call the mid-tier squeeze, where uh, the small companies remain constant, the large companies increase their market share at the expense of the medium-sized companies. Um, when we look at the services market as a whole and include construction, and you'll see that when we discuss construction in more detail, the medium-sized companies come back in that area and as a result of that, uh, and they do so in a significant enough manner uh, that as a result of that, the share of the large companies actually decreases. Can you sure. Last year, in the FRS category, that did not include Correct, yes. Construction is not reflected anywhere in the last year. Right. And so previous year's reports, and actually the 2010 data uh, bears this out as well. Um, there is, in professional services, without including construction, there is a squeeze in the mid-tier uh, due to the increase in the large category. Uh, 
Um, next slide uh, shows you the top 20 uh, service contractors for 2000 and 2010. Um, it shows you for each company uh, what their service, uh, federal services uh, revenue was that year. Um, and at the bottom, you've got the, the um, total services contracts uh, value for that year. So you can get a sense of uh, how the, the, the uh, share of the top 20 and the top five is, has changed. Um, in fact, the share of the top 20 hasn't changed very much. It was about 32% in, uh, in uh, 2000 and about 30% uh, in 2010. Um, what's changed is the share of the top five out of the, the uh, overall uh, service contracting total. Uh, it's uh, changed quite significantly from about 20% in 2000 to about 15% in 2010. Um, what's also changed, and this is also very interesting for us, is the, the types of companies that made the top 20. Um, in 2010, you see three companies uh, in the health services sector. Um, HealthNet, Humana, TriWest Healthcare. Uh, no, uh, not one of them was, uh, was around in 2000 to a significant enough degree to, to put them in the top 20. Um, again, that's driven uh, primarily by DOD. We'll see that when we look at, at uh, the Department of Defense and, and also at the medical services more closely. Um, the other interesting thing for us is um, sort of what, uh, what we call critical mass or um, the amount of service contract dollars you had to uh, pull in as a company to make it into the top 20. So you'll see that in 2000, it was about 760 billion, uh, million, sorry. Uh, in 2010, you needed about 2.2 billion to make it into the top 20. Uh, this seems like a good point to reinforce that this is prime contracts. So if you looked at subcontract figures, which would actually reflect revenue a bit different, um, more accurately in some ways, the distribution would be a bit different. And we don't yet have the ability to track how much different. Right. How does this handle joint ventures? So we consider joint ventures a, a, a separate entity. And as you'll see, there are some joint ventures in here just by virtue of the business that they generate as a joint venture. Um, these are primarily Department of Energy uh, contracts for facilities management and, uh, and support uh, types of contracts, um, where it'll uh, usually be a university partnering with uh, industry in order to manage places like Los Alamos and Savannah River and things like that for DOE. Yes, Larry. Bechtel was uh, in the fifth place in uh, 2000. But uh, companies like URS, no, but you're right, but URS, um, um, I'm trying to think, look at who else. Um, and some of these are more dramatic of the work spending actually in prior years. Um, KBR is down a bit. Um, and Hal Burton did go up a fair amount from 860 million, as you might expect. Um, now that still the war spending still shows up in a variety of ways, but it's now more distributed than mm. the we've seen in some of the prior reports. Right. 
If, actually, that's a good point. If you look at some of our earlier reports, um, um, I now remember that the text does discuss the entry of companies like Fluor and, uh, uh, and other uh, more sort of construction services related companies into the top 20. Uh, that showed up in around uh, probably 2005, six, seven, that time period when um, you know, we were more active in those areas in Iraq and Afghanistan. See, um, one additional note. Oh. Right. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. One additional note on joint ventures. Joint ventures are classified as um, large companies if any of their components are large. So most joint ventures are large. And one, you can see the effect of our joint venture classification in the University of California, which in 2000 was largely operating on its own, um, but in 2010 is not on the list despite being part of a good number of joint ventures. This next chart, um, it's table 3.2 in the report on page 39, um, shows you the uh, sort of cross area pollination um, in 2000 and 2010 between the various uh, uh, service categories or service areas. Um, what is interesting here, there are several interesting things. Um, the first is that there seems to be a lot of uh, uh, cross-area um, um, relationships between uh, the PAMS category and the IT category. Um, you see, for example, that um, um, about 33% of the companies, the IT companies in 2000, were also active in the PAMS area in 2010. That was about, that grew to 46% of the companies. So almost half the companies, half the IT companies are also doing PAMS work. You see that a lot of the R&D companies are also doing PAMS work. And interestingly, now that we're looking at medical, um, you see that a lot of the medical service companies are also doing PAMS work. Part of that is just that PAMS is one of the larger categories and so uh, uh, a lot of business is driven by that. The um, other professional services category also falls within PAMS. That was where log cap ended up. And so there's probably a slight methodological issue that if you're not that well categorized, you have a fair chance of ending up in PAMS if you are a professional service. All right, this next part of the, the presentation starts digging a little deeper into each one of these service areas. And we start with the IT area. We'll go through these relatively quickly because there's a lot of uh, ground that we've already covered. Uh, but really what we've tried to do both in the report and in this presentation is to give you sort of snapshots of each of the service areas um, by the various uh, uh, categories and components that we've discussed up until now. So for each of these service areas, the six that we've discussed so far, you'll see um, on the top left, the breakdown by government customer. Um, and this is where you'll see for uh, most areas, the dominance of the Department of Defense. Um, that'll be the green bar, uh, the green piece of each bar at the bottom of the top left-hand chart. Um, you'll see the extent of competition in the uh, middle top row. Uh, you'll see funding mechanism, contract vehicle, and contractor size, the small, medium, and large breakdown um, at the bottom right there. And at the top right, you'll see the list of top 10 contractors for 2010 for each of those service areas. So we'll go through these relatively quickly, pointing out some of the, for us, uh, more interesting trends and, and uh, data points. Um, for IT, I think the interesting piece here is, or one of the interesting pieces here, is the uh, share of the market held by small companies. This is the service category with the largest share of the market held by small companies. It's about 28% in 2010. Um, the other piece in, the, in looking at the breakdown of small, medium, and large in, in the IT sector is the rise of the large companies. You see that their share 
that's the green bar there at the bottom right hand chart, their share grew from about a third to more than half uh, over the 10 year period. The next uh, area we look at is PAMS. Uh, that's on slide 16. Again, you see the, the dominance of DOD and also the, the, the rapid growth in this uh, service area um, uh, from the DOD customer. Um, you see that most of these uh, service contracts uh, are actually competed with multiple offers being received. That's the middle uh, chart at the top row. You'll see that it's about evenly spread in terms of value between fixed price and cost plus contracts. And on the bottom right hand side, you will again here uh, uh, see the, the a pretty significant squeeze in the share of the market held by medium sized companies. We talked earlier on about if we were looking just at professional services, how you, you see a more significant squeeze of the mid tier companies. When you look at an even smaller subset of just the professional administrative and management support service um, category. The large companies grow from about 35% of the market in 2005, uh, six to about 42% in 2010, and the medium-sized companies drop from 42% uh, uh, to about 35%, with the small remaining relatively constant at, uh, again, 22%. Although you will see a slight countervailing trend in 2010, where medium continued to grow, but large dropped a little bit. Uh, we speculate that stimulus spending might be a driver there. Um, but that's a trend you'll see in a few different areas. Specifically right. in 2010, it was a good year for the mid-tier, fairly across the board. Right. Looking at R&D services, um, this is one of the more uh, dramatic charts in terms of how skewed most of these smaller, uh, smaller charts are. Um, you'll see that uh, the Department of Defense really is uh, 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 the almost only game in town uh, for, for R&D service contracts. Um, for the most part, they're cost plus contracts, who knew? Um, nobody doing any fixed price R&D work these days, or in the past 10 years, actually. Um, um, and the other uh, uh, sort of uh, green colored uh, bar that jumps out at you here is on the bottom right hand side again. Uh, we can really see that, that the R&D market is the large company's uh, uh, market. Uh, it's really tough to, to uh, make it in this market as a small company and uh, um, as a medium-sized company as well. Both of these um, uh, categories have been declining as a share of the total market, whereas the larger companies have increased their share of the market to almost 65% in 2010. Um, I'd wager just right. I'd wager that that since most of the work is done at DoD and most of the work is is um, cost plus, most of it is uh, most of DoD's R and D contracts are cost plus contracts. We have not broken it down into um, uh, by government agency based on the type of uh, uh, the contract when it comes in. Next chart, uh, number 18, page 30 in your reports, uh, looks at the equipment-related services market. Uh, this even more than R&D is sort of the, the, the DOD uh, domain. Um, again, primarily driven by operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, a lot of equipment-related services associated with that, um, and a lot of the business, as you can see from the list of top 10 contractors, uh, going to those companies that actually make the equipment that's being repaired. Um, so uh, probably no surprise there either to most of you. Um, 
interestingly, here again, there's uh, 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 a trend of uh, uh, the mid-tier losing ground to the larger companies with the small companies maintaining their share. What's interesting here will be to see how uh, um, once operations in Iraq and Afghanistan wind down as they are, uh, how that will affect this, uh, this service area. Um, on the one hand, there might be a, 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 a sort of a reset of uh, uh, the equipment with uh, old equipment being uh, uh, retired and new equipment being bought. Um, on the other hand, we might just fix what, we're, what we've got and try and make it last a little longer, uh, in which case this category will probably uh, continue to be a growth area. Next chart is uh, facilities related services and construction. Um, here, as we uh, hinted at earlier, the DOD dominance is slightly less uh, visible. And there's actually uh, uh, another player, uh, uh, another government customer uh, that takes a significant chunk of the, the FRS and construction uh, market, and that's the Department of Energy. That's the uh, dark blue slice of each bar on the top left-hand chart. The other interesting uh, thing here for us, and we've hinted at this as well earlier on, is uh, the role of medium-sized companies in uh, uh, the facilities related services and construction area. Um, this is one of the few uh, service areas where uh, not only is there not a mid-tier squeeze, there's actually a large tier squeeze, if you will. The large companies are losing ground to the small and medium-sized companies. So small companies account for about 28% of the market value in 2010 for this area, and um, medium-sized companies for about half of that market. Yeah. Um, and one thing to note, with the Department of Energy being such a dominant player, and the Department of Energy fairly exclusively using large contractors, everything Guy just said is even more true for the non-DOE FRS and construction market. Um, you can see how large the DOE is there, and they're a very unique customer, as we'll see later. Oops. Not good. There we go. Uh, last category is uh, medical services. Um, again, this is a new category for us, so uh, everything we see here is, uh, is uh, new. Um, but uh, we were surprised, actually, at how large uh, a share of this market went into uh, the Department of Defense. Um, again, there's almost no other uh, uh, government customer that even shows up on the chart in a significant manner. Um, and uh, um, again, the, the, the companies that you see um, on uh, the top right-hand table there, uh, not your traditional defense or research and technology types of uh, customers, a very uh, uh, sort of uh, specialized uh, market here. It'll be interesting to see if some of the larger uh, defense contractors or, or construction and FRS contractors try to uh, uh, sort of uh, make their way into this market, uh, given that it's been the fastest growing uh, in the last 10 years. We've already seen some anecdotal evidence of uh, some of the larger um, aerospace and defense companies trying to make inroads into this market through uh, mergers and acquisitions. The next set of slides um, will... One question. Yes, Ray. Right. The other departments the government don't have that. But there's no DOE. Um, the, the cutoff for in being included as a government customer in our list of, uh, of companies that we, or customers that we broke out, um, was to have at least $10 billion worth of uh, service contracts dollars obligated for uh, that particular year. And um, 
and VA didn't make that cut. It might be that just for medical services, they would be a more significant uh, uh, customer and therefore show up on these charts, but uh, they didn't make it, if you will, into our top six, seven uh, uh, government agencies and departments list. And so we didn't include them here uh, uh, in any of the analyses. But you're right, that's probably, there's probably a, uh, some, some dollars going to VA in this category. You can see that the other bar under government customer is the second most prominent in that graph. Mm -hmm. And so VA right. would appear in that other bar, as would other um, medical civilian agencies. Right. It's also worth specifying that we follow the contracting agency and not the funding agency. That may not be relevant to this particular discussion. Uh, it's most relevant to um, the GSA. But when we say the customer, we mean who is contracting, not who is paying for it. So this last uh, set of charts will look at um, a similar breakdown of sort of one page uh, overviews, uh, but this time uh, by government customer. And so starting with the Department of Defense for each one of the uh, top six agencies, I think actually here we, we focused on the, the five biggest ones. Um, we'll break it down into sort of uh, uh, the categories that we've seen earlier. Uh, the difference here will be that uh, on the top left-hand side, you'll have the breakdown into the service areas for that particular government customer. So this is the breakdown for DOD. Um, again, a few surprises there for, for those of us, and I think that's the majority of this audience who, who follow the department and, uh, and work with the department. Um, large chunks of uh, service dollars going to R&D, PAMs, and facilities and uh, 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 construction-related services. Um, DOD is one of those government agencies that have uh, sort of been improving in terms of how much they compete, how much of their service contracts they're competing. Um, and you can see on the middle top hand, uh, top row, that um, there's been a steady, steady and significant growth in uh, the uh, level of competition with multiple offers um, uh, in DOD service contracting. You'll see sort of the probably list of usual suspects on the top right-hand side in terms of who the top 10 uh, uh, suppliers to DOD are. And at the bottom right-hand side, um, the trend in terms of the breakdown of small, medium, and large companies uh, for DOD business has again been one of the small companies maintaining their share at around 20% and the large companies increasing theirs from about 40 to about 50 percent over the 10-year period at the expense of the mid-sized uh, mid uh, companies. It, it does, but it's a lot of work because you have to cross-reference mergers and acquisitions to past business. So te technically, the, 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 the ability to do that sort of breakout is there. We haven't done it just because it was so time-intensive. But uh, uh, I would say it's probably both, the, the, that this growth in the share of the market that goes to large companies is both a result of they're getting better at getting these contracts, and they're also merging and acquiring smaller companies that already have contracts. Is that 50, 50 split or maybe split? Right, we don't know. The next department we're looking at is the Department of Energy, slide 23 on page 46. Um, here again, the picture is very, very uh, uh, skewed uh, and unidirectional for most of these charts. Um, you'll see that most of DOD's service contract dollars go to facilities and construction related services. Um, it, they're primarily cost plus contracts. Um, 
and they go primarily to large companies. And what's interesting here is, is um, that the share of the small companies is almost insignificant. It, it, it's less than two to five percent. Uh, some years it's as low as two. Um, whereas large companies account for about 80% of the DOD, DOE services market. And again, you see in the top 10 list a lot of joint ventures here. Um, for the most part, these are university industry collaborations. NASA, on page, uh, on slide 24, page 49 of the report, is the next agency we looked at. Um, interesting for us here was uh, the split um, between PAMS and R&D dollars. Um, with uh, PAMS sort of uh, rising over the last few years, as you see in the top left-hand chart. Um, again, there's, there's uh, 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 a preference for cost-plus contracts at NASA. Um, out of the top agencies that we've looked at, uh, they're probably the ones that um, have the least competition in their service contracting. And um, as we wrap up sort of the top three agencies, DOD, DOE, and NASA, it's worth noting that together the three of them account for about 75% of the federal service contract market. DOD is about 60%. Uh, the top three are about three quarters of the market. Larry? Yes, we didn't do that here, but but it's it follows the same the same sort of uh, numbering scheme, six one six two, and a slightly different uh, coding, but it's essentially this very similar to the DoD, um, um, yeah, categorization. Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. <laughs> That was a single large contract to Caltech, uh, and we validated that USAspending.gov and Bloomberg um, reports the same thing. Uh, we are a little suspicious of it. Um, what likely happened is that it was a multi-year contract reported in a single year for obligation purposes. Uh, you don't obligate multi-year contracts in a single year. Right, which would mean that it was somewhat misclassified. Would you reconcile that dollar amount versus the amount of appropriations they got? It looked like more than appropriations. Yeah, we're going to further look at that. NASA is not a um, agency, the primary agency we've broken out in the past. So this is one of those cases where we try to simply highlight right. this is what we know. And as we learn more, and hopefully as the data corrects itself if necessary, or we find out the exact reason for a very large spend, we'll update our uh, report. There is a, FBDS has a funding only transaction option. So to the degree that it is being written out uh, to the uh, contractor over multiple years, it should be showing up over multiple years. So the general pattern should be that unless Caltech got a significant check that year, it should be in multiple. Though that, this might be an instance where it all came in one year or um, uh, more likely it was spread and this was just how they put it into the system.
to about 15%. DHS is the next agency we, uh, department we looked at. Um, here what's interesting, and by the way, we had a, 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 have a whole separate report on DHS. Uh, there are copies outside if uh, you are interested in uh, digging a little deeper in that market. Um, that report covers products and services. Um, this, again, is just the services slice of it. But the same is true for DHS overall. Because it's really an amalgamation of so many different entities, that were sort of uh, uh, forced under one roof uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2002, but only really started contracting out as a single entity in about 2004. That's why you see the, the uh, several years worth of uh, no data in these charts. Um, there's really no major trend that you can discern here. Uh, um, you know, TSA is very different from Customs and Border Protection, and they're very different from the Coast Guard, and so the mul multitude of entities here makes pulling out specific trends very difficult. The one thing that does come out and is, is uh, interesting, again, to us from an industrial-based perspective is the breakdown of small, medium, and large companies. DHS is, uh, has consistently uh, um, done better than the government goal of 22, 23% to small businesses, in fact, They've, for the last five or six years, been at about 30% uh, of their service contracts to small businesses. Uh, another 30% or so goes to medium-sized companies and about 40% um, to large companies, which, by the way, is down from about 50% in 2005-2006. Uh, um, again, this can in part be explained by the fact that um, there are so many different entities at DHS, some of which... Uh, uh, probably lean towards doing business, more business with small and medium-sized companies than with uh, large companies. Um, there just aren't that many uh, large companies probably out there that make the specific widgets that different pieces of DHS are interested in. Uh, so it's much more of a, 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 a balanced market in terms of the industrial base here. Larry. FPDS, yes, it is. It is there. You've got uh, you've got address. I think you might even have um, zip codes and and things like that for each of the uh, uh, contractors. And so, yes, the potential is there to to break it out by geographic area and where where the business is performed. Uh, yes, but it's both. Um, and I think we should start getting the habit of repeating the questions for our online viewers. True. But for geographic information, there is vendor information. Um, and also place of performance information. So we don't use that as of yet, but there's ways to look at both. Um, fortunately, there is a good answer in 2006, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and yes, if you actually look at the unlabeled in funding mechanism and competition, it's still notable, but there are very real percentage improvements. Um, in fact, that happened for much of the government. We include a later table that we may not go over in this presentation that tracks serious improvements by most of the government customers for their labeling. Uh, I think the GSA is one notable exception, and uh, NASA to some degree. So still would like to get that smaller, but kudos for what they've done uh, from 2009 to 2010. And, and good point on 2006. That's a lot of uh, trailer and uh, uh, sort of shelter-related uh, service contracts there for that year. Yes. I think it's actually both. I'm not sure. Right. 
Right. In separate research we've done for Iraq and Afghanistan, where we've made more use of that, um, there often isn't detail beyond country. But we do see contracting offices based in the US have place of performance in Iraq and Afghanistan. So at least some of the time, it's based on where it's actually taking place. But we'd have to start using that data more to give you a detailed answer. Um, the question, uh, to quickly repeat, this place of performance track contracting office or wherever work actually takes place. The last uh, government entity that we'll go into in this presentation, and there are a few others in the report, uh, but um, the last one for this presentation is uh, we've lumped together the Department of State and the uh, Agency for International Development. Uh, for the uh, uh, purpose of getting, again, sort of a, a broader uh, sense of where our diplomacy and development uh, service contracts are, are going. Um, and not surprising, they're uh, going into the PAMS area. Um, I say not surprising, but it's worth noting that uh, things like uh, private security contracts are included in that category. In fact, they're categorized as other professional services. Um, and, uh, and we include those under PAMS. Uh, that accounts for uh, some of the growth in that category. The, and you can see that in the list of top 10 companies on the top right-hand side, uh, where you've got sort of a, a nice mix of sort of uh, private security contractors, um, development uh, contractors like Comonix and development alternatives. Um, as well as some of the sort of more traditional uh, uh, construction and uh, um, um, security contractors. What's the one with the asterisk? Uh, Project for Supply Chain Management. Um, it is managed by two fairly small companies and near as I can figure out is largely a pass-through for a variety of others. Uh, their partner institutions include Booz Allen and Northrop, as well as, I believe, about a dozen others. Uh, and um, the question was about um, PFSCM. Also, as a minor methodological note, state and aid, as well as HHS, are one of the few places where the other funding mechanism actually shows up that was not broken out in the main top-line chart but we include here because a few customers and areas actually do make use of that area. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us where that uh, growth in R&D is taking a, a response? Um, I don't think we've identified specific contracts there. Um, it, is, it is surprising that, that there is even a significant amount of R&D money coming out of uh, uh, state and aid. Um, it, it'll be interesting. We, we can dig a little deeper into that and see sort of if there's any one or a handful of contracts that are driving that or, and then say whether or not they really are R&D contracts. It might be another case of uh, erroneous classification as we saw with the log cap contract. The specific code, um, the question state and aid R&D, the specific code that often gets used erroneously is uh, services management and support, which is meant to refer to research, the management and support of research into services. Um, but the title itself can be a little confusing. We've noticed that there's been some significant reclassifications out of that code, so there appears to be a crackdown. I do not know if that drives this phenomenon, right. but it wouldn't be that surprising. And of note also here, um, again, in the bottom right-hand chart is uh, the dominance of actually medium-sized companies in this uh, uh, um, in this uh, um, area. So uh, um, small companies, a very insignificant share of the market here, and large companies, um, relatively steady, but the majority of the growth has been uh, in the share of medium-sized companies. So 
so that's pretty much what we have for you today. We wanted to leave you with some of the, what we consider the key, to be the key policy areas, or policy issues that, that um, um, this data uh, can help us speak to. And uh, we address those and others in uh, the last chapter in the report that you have. Uh, but for the purpose of uh, uh, generating further discussion, either here or later, um, we wanted to put a few of the what we consider to be the key ones up here on the, uh, the, the board for you. Um, certainly, um, in sort of uh, the, the current budgetary environment where um, uh, everybody is uh, scrambling to generate savings and, uh, and uh, cut costs, uh, it'll be interesting to see whether um, um, that affects the services uh, market as well. Um, in the past years, um, uh, we've seen, uh, certainly on the DOD side, but for a lot of the other government agencies, uh, spikes in spending, the likes of which we'll probably not see again in the near future. Um, we've also interestingly seen, uh, uh, in the last few years, an increase in the workforce. Uh, um, and yet, that has come in parallel with an increase in service co contract dollars. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how those trends uh, uh, continue in the next few years. Uh, Um, I think it would show up in the PAMS category, but it wouldn't be all of the PAMS category. So I'd be careful about um, sort of drawing any conclusions based on, on that relatively broad category. Um, we can break that category down into, uh, you know, its individual service codes. Uh, we haven't done that for this purpose, but, uh, but that'll, that'll allow you to get at a, a more precise indication of, of what you're asking. How, how large essentially the share of uh, CEDA contracts or, or sort of uh, support. It's certainly a policy uh, concern. Remember right. the, the uh, Washington Post article on the, uh, on the uh, classified area. Right. No, that's a, that's a good point. And again, the data allows you to, to take a, a closer look at that, and we haven't done that for the purpose of this report. Yes, and actually, if we're in the formal Q&A uh, session now, uh, we've got a mic that we can pass around, and uh, um, if you'd actually please introduce yourselves, and uh, uh, um, we'll take any questions you might have. So I, I get the first one. Thank you. Uh, Jason Miller, Federal News Radio. Um, I guess two related questions. The first one is, I know you guys look at the task order contracts and the use of federal supply schedule as they're reported in FPDS, but was there any thoughts about breaking those out separately, especially some of the bigger... Uh, government-wide acquisition contracts, uh, SOUP, which is, I know more products, but has some services, or NIH, CIOSP2, or Alliant. And then uh, a second question is, if you could offer some insight in terms of, there's been a big push by OMB, the administration, to cut service contracting, specifically the uh, professional administrative management support services. Right. Are you starting to see that yet? And do you, see, do you foresee that in your 2011, 2012 reports really taking the bigger effect? You want to take the first question? Sure. Um, so the FSS, GWAC, and the like um, are included in the other IDV category, or FSS and other. We, that varies reasonably from agency to agency and uh, from area to area. Uh, it's notable, uh, if you look at information communications technology, that's one area where they see heavy use Unsurprisingly, GSA also has heavy use. It hasn't quite registered in dollar terms enough to get into a more detailed breakout, but it might be worth doing from a policy basis. 
And we have that detail, so if you'd like to talk more about this afterwards, we certainly can. Regarding your second question, Jason, um, I'm on, for our online viewers, I'm on uh, chart, eight, uh, chart six, page seven in the report. Um, you can see that um, though most of the, the total service contracts in uh, 2010 dropped by about 10 billion overall, um, that did not affect the PAMS category, which remained steady at uh, about 96 billion um, over the last uh, two years. It's risen considerably in the previous years. In the last few years, it's remained constant. Uh, so we have yet to see any significant shift in uh, uh, how the government uh, obligates its uh, PAMS uh, contracts. Um, speaking of uh, uh, the uh, trends uh, in the last few years for some of these categories, um, the IT category has been the only one to grow, albeit by a, a, a relatively small amount. It's just about a billion dollars from 2009 to 2010, but that was the only category to grow in, the, uh, uh, in that period of time. Um, interesting because if uh, you track back sort of IT spending uh, even earlier than 2000, that has been one of the slower growing uh, 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 service areas in recent years. Uh, most of the growth in that area occurred in the early 90s. Um, also, I should add, uh, DHS is another major user of the other IDV categories. And if any of our online viewers wish to submit questions, again, the email address is gsanders at csas.org. It should be on your screen as well. Karen? Uh, hi. Sorry, could you wait for the mic, Karen, please? Karen Wilson from Boeing. Uh, a question for you uh, on page 69 of you the report, it talks about competition and sole source might be more valuable in some cases. And you, you talk about CAGR being different. Could you explain a little bit more about what the, what, what were you, you were trying to communicate in that context? So we were, we were basically looking back at sort of what the data shows us in terms of uh, uh, the growth rates for each of these competition categories over the last, uh, in this case, uh, uh, 10 years or 11 years. You don't see the CAGRs up on the chart here and they're in the text, um, but we were just trying to give a better sense of what uh, the year-on-year -year growth rates have been for some of these categories. We were specifically looking at the competition with the single offer, which as you can see goes from 13 billion in 2000 to 52 billion in 2010, and still has significant growth, admittedly only from 39 to 52 if you look from 2006 to 2010. Uh, the single offer competition is, as we discussed earlier, indicative of competition not serving the desired purpose. Um, just offering it for competition might get some benefits, but I believe it's widely understood that actually receiving multiple offers is the desired goal of competition, and so Perhaps if you are pointing out competition and only getting a single offer, another mechanism may be more appropriate. Does that answer the question? Cecil. Uh, Cecil Black from the Boeing Company. Uh, Dr. Stephen Fuller of uh, George Mason has produced a study that said the impact of sequestration on the Department of Defense investment programs, that's RDT and E procurement, uh, would generate 1,008,000 job losses in America. And since this is a very substantial market, uh, larger than that in fact, I wonder if you could draw some implications uh, on the basis of what you've observed in your data that would give us a feel for what is the implication and job losses in the services sector as a result of uh, uh, both the budget caps that are already in place and the potential impact of sequestration. That's a great question, but one of the harder ones to answer because we don't have uh, data on number of employees for each of these companies that, that are tracked uh, um, in FPDS. Uh, we can cross-reference with, uh, possibly, I actually, possibly cross-reference with other data sources to get at that, uh, 
but right now what we have is the number of contractors, which as uh, we saw in one of these earlier slides, um, is at around 157,000. Um, that's number of companies. Um, so if, if you want to extrapolate from that in terms of what, what uh, uh, reductions in service contracts would mean for the industrial base and therefore for employment, um, I'd say that that's probably not too big of a stretch, but it's not something that the data can, can tell us. Is that a fair? Dave, please. Massachusetts, uh, Dave Patterson, uh, National Defense Business Institute at uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, University of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst uh, every year puts out uh, what is a billion dollars of defense spending. And uh, this last year, they said a billion dollars of defense spending uh, generates or sustains 11,600 jobs. And uh, it's up from 8,333, which I can't account for, but I'll, I'll go with their number. And um, so, you know, you start, to, you start to work it backwards. And it, for uh, every 1% of, uh, of uh, unemployment, it's about $133 billion if you take what they say as being true. Defense, Defense dollars, right, yes, sir. Uh, probably the ideal with this sort of thing, and if anyone wishes to partner with us on this, uh, would be if we could actually get the multipliers for various sectors. I don't know whether it would be better by government customer or by service area. I suspect it might actually be service area um, to look at where different hits would affect in different ways. Right. Um, and the multiplier effects are one of the key areas there, but a bit beyond the expertise of this report as is. Any other questions? Tom, please. Um, I, do you have any data on the um, contracting personnel workforce across the agencies? Not from FPDS. Um, and actually, I don't know where a good open source for that data might be. Uh, if, and just see if my logic is correct. Your, your data has shown over 10 years, a large increase in services contracting, right. uh, an increase in contract actions, and an increase in competitively awarded contracts. Right. So all of those proposals going in have to be read and evaluated right. by someone. Uh, I think the contracting staff has remained relatively flat. It would be interesting to see that data because it seems like it's a you know, bit of a triple whammy um, and, you know, we in the industry, I'm sorry, I'm from PAE, we in the industry see, you know, uh, longer delays, just, you know, a lack of bandwidth right. uh, to process um, the work of the government. I think, I think that's a fair point. I, 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 I think there, there, I remember seeing some data that, that maybe not in the last year, but there were attempts to, to uh, do more insourcing uh, uh, um, uh, in certain agencies and departments at least. Uh, but you're right, overall the trend is of there's more contract actions, there's more contract dollars, uh, there's more contract tours, and there's more competition. And, and yes, I think it's not a, a stretch to deduce from that that the workload on the, the contracting workforce or the, even the contract evaluation workforce is, is much increased. Right. We have pulled those numbers before. I think we had used a GAO source as our uh, um, source, but I believe we haven't seen anything for the past few, maybe even several years. The trend was stagnation, and we haven't read anything and other sources to indicate otherwise. But I, I, I don't remember if they broke it down into services versus product acquisition workforce. Um, and that's one of the issues that we highlight in the report is that ser acquiring services is different uh, from acquiring products. And yet um, the majority of the acquisition workforce is trained for product acquisition. 
uh, at least traditionally, that has been the case, and um, and there, there's no trend to indicate that that's changing significantly. And I will, again, in giving credit, we often do raise various concerns about data quality, um, and I am certain that the contracting workforce is as overworked as ever, but they have managed from 2009 to 2010, and in past years as well, to make notable improvements in classification in several areas. So I don't think that is indicative that they're less overworked, but I think it shows that they've made it a priority and should be complimented for such. Okay, so if there's no further questions, thank you very much for being here with us, either in person or on the web. Um, and uh, if there's any follow-up questions or areas that uh, you think uh, would be interesting to look at uh, in this field or using this data, we'd be very happy to hear your thoughts on those. Thank you very much again. Oh, and uh, thank you to co-authors Jesse Elman and David Morrow.